privileges and elections to order. Good morning and welcome to the Committee on Rules, Privileges and Elections. My name is Karen Koslowitz and I am the Chair of the Rules Committee. Before we begin, I would like to introduce the other members of this committee who are present. Council Member Mark Traeger, Council Member Margaret Chin, Council Member Rory Lansman, Council Member Adrian Adams, Council Member Richie Torres, Council Member Mario, and Council Member Vanessa Gibson. I would also like to acknowledge counsel to the committee, Elizabeth Guzman. I would also like to acknowledge the staff members from the council's investigative unit, Chuck Davis, director of investigations, as well as Andre Johnson Brown. Topics for consideration. Today, the council will consider three candidates, Salvatore Shibetta, did I do okay? a resident of Staten Island for appointment to the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals as a lay member to fill a vacancy and serve the remainder of a six-year term that expires <clears throat> on July 10, 2019, and Anthony W. Crowell and Fernando Bohorquez, both residents of Brooklyn, for reappointment as members of the Conflicts of Interest Board to serve a six-year term that begins on April 1st, 2018 and expires on March 31st, 2024. I will now call the speaker is not here. He'll be here later. The BSA consists of five commissioners, each appointed by the mayor for a term of six years. The city charter provides that one of the BSA's members shall be a planner with professional qualifications and at least 10 years experience as a planner. One of the members shall be a registered architect and shall have at least 10 years experience as an architect. And one of the members shall be a licensed professional engineer and shall have at least 10 years experience as an engineer. The part particular qualifications of the two members remaining members are not delineated in the charter. The mayor designates one of the members with the required experience of an architect, planner, or engineer to serve as chair and designates another member to serve as vice chair. No more than two members may reside in any one borough. Each member of the board receives a salary and may not engage in any other occupation, profession, or employment. The chair earns an annual salary of $212,044. The vice chair receives $174,523 annually, while the remaining members earn annual salaries of $166,000. The BSA has the power to determine and vary the application of the zoning resolution and to issue special permits as authorized by the zoning resolution. The BSA may also consider appeals to vary or modify any rule or regulation of the provisions of any law relating to the construction <clears throat> use, you have to, excuse me, I have a cold, use, structural changes, equipment, alteration, or removal of buildings or structures or vaults in the sidewalks are pertinent thereto, where there are <clears throat> practical difficulties or unnecessary hardships in carrying out the strict letter of the law so that the spirit of the law shall be observed, public safety secured, and substantial justice done. Welcome the candidates. Welcome, Mr. Shibeta. Would you all please raise your right hand to be sworn in? Good morning. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth? Thank you. Thank you. 
Rules Committee members, you can find a written copy of the opening statements for these candidates in your booklet. Mr. Shibeta, do you wish to make any opening statement? Sure. Good morning, Chair Koslowitz and members of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections. My name is Salvatore Shibeta, and I am greatly honored to be here today to present testimony regarding my nomination as Commissioner of New York City's Board of Standards and Appeals. I am a lifelong New Yorker. I have lived in multiple boroughs and worked in all of them. New York is my home, and Staten Island is where I have chosen to raise my two children. I ask for your consideration in this position so that I may do my part to ensure my children, as well as all of the other children in this great city, grow up in the best New York there could be. My passion has always been, and continues to be, community service. I strongly believe in active participation in, in the community as a means of investing in something greater than myself. Through my involvement in many community-based organizations representing a wide cross-section of New Yorkers, I have honed my ability to listen to different constituencies, deeply consider their perspectives, and address their concerns. Serving others has been the foundation of some of, of, some of my most rewarding experiences. And if appointed, I will bring this passion for service to the PSA. By trade, I'm a seasoned litigation attorney who has conducted over 100 hearings. I have practiced in various areas of law, including real estate and law related to buildings and violations, which is particularly relevant for the PSA. Throughout my years as an attorney, I've had a wide variety of clients, serving mostly the people of the city of New York, with clients ranging from our city's most vulnerable children to multi-million dollar corporations. This varied experience has taught me to see issues from all sides and to understand the value of a just outcome to every person. After spending the last several years as a partner in an international law firm, I felt the need to return to my roots in the public sector. My experience indicates how hard I have worked as an attorney, as well as my dedication to my community. If I am appointed to serve, I hope to become a valuable resource, not only for the board, but also for the city, New York City as a whole. I will, I will ensure the board's decisions are made for the interest of the public, and, and with the utmost rigor, integrity, and care. It would be a privilege to serve as commissioner on the Board of Standards and Appeals, and I welcome any questions you may have for me. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Council Member, okay, Council Member Steve Matteo. Oh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Mr. Beta. Um, I, as you know, I represent uh, the Mid Island portion of Staten Island District 50, and um, like. Um, most, unlike most of the other boroughs, Staten Island has many streets um, that are not part of the city map. Um, developments as, uh, assessed from these streets negatively affect local traffic and the quality of life throughout my district, being that BSA uh, is designated to review these applications pursuant to general city law. What is your opinion on the parameters of this review? Thank you, Council Member. Okay. Um, Council Member Torres here. Councilmember Torres? Councilmember Torres, do you have any questions? Madam Chair, he didn't, he didn't finish answering I didn't answering respond mine. to hmm? He didn't finish answering my question. I, I didn't begin to. Sorry. No worries. Uh, Councilmember, I believe that, I believe that the, the community character has to play a very big role in making these decisions. I believe that it's important for the BSA to be aware of, of all that goes into these unmapped streets and the problems that, that come from them, including the waste management and the, the snow that has to be shoveled because this isn't part of sanitation. And I believe that along with your help and, and the help of the borough president, I believe that your, your input and the input of the community is a, is a great value to the BSA in making a determination on these issues. Well, I, I thank you for that, and I thank you for understanding that there are um, consequences once these private streets are built in, in terms of other city agencies um, and resources. And, and, and the other question I have, uh, uh, since I've been elected and, and with my colleagues, w we've been talking um, and called out BSA leadership, quite frankly, on, on, on the hardship issue and how um, a developer will buy a property, you know, fully well known what they can build, but decide that they want to bring hardship argument to the BSA and 
build something that is out of character of the neighborhood against community wishes. So just wondering your thoughts on, on this hardship issue. As a whole, I believe that the community has, well, okay, so hardship has, it's a two-pronged type of test. There is, obviously it has to be a unique issue that creates a, a condition that would not have any, any reasonable return. Um, but that has to be balanced against whether this variance or would alter the community at large. And these competing interests, if there are competing interests, have to, have to go through a balancing test where the community reaches out and lets the, and speak testifies, and lets the, the, the board know what kind of changes this would bring. Now, I think that it's so relevant and important uh, to a definition of whether a hardship has occurred. Uh, it's so relevant to, to, to balance the community input against it. Well, I appreciate your understanding the balance and my constituents are, surely aren't uh, shy in bringing up their concerns to the BSA. So uh, with that, I look forward to, to working with you. Thank you. <laughs> Council Member Traeger. <laughs> Thank you uh, to Chair Kosowitz, and thank you for your, for your opening testimony, Mrs. Cabetta. So the question I have is um, many of the applicants that come before BSA uh, have with them, you know, well, are, are themselves as well, uh, attorneys, zoning attorneys, people who are advocating on behalf of certain developers, developments, who have the means and capacity to come before BSA file voluminous paperwork and go through the processes. Um, how do you suggest we as policymakers or the city of New York level the playing field for communities that are at many times impacted by what is being considered uh, before BSA but don't have the means to also hire a zoning expert or a zoning attorney or a developer attorney or planning attorney to make sure that their concerns are adequately heard because many of us have worked hard uh, from a policy perspective, from a budget perspective, to provide um, free counseling for tenants facing eviction, for example, uh, unfair eviction. How do you suggest we level the playing field for impacted communities that are affected by decisions that BSA makes? I really appreciate that question because it speaks about our less fortunate and people who still deserve a right to be, to be heard. Um, and while I cannot testify to the inner workings of the BSA at this time because I'm not on, a member of the board, I can say that if, elect, if appointed, I, I would treat every single applicant equally. And as a litigation attorney, I read every piece of paper myself. I read every word. I, I try to read between the lines. I try to weigh out all the issues. A person's rights and a community's rights are important to me. And that, that is something that I, I hope to bring to the BSA along with the rest of my experience. Thank you. Any other questions? With that, I will continue. The charter states that BSA members may not engage in any other occupation, profession, or employment. Mr. Shibeta, for the record, can you please confirm that if appointed to BSA, you will no longer accept judicial appointments to act as a referee. I can. I, I will no longer accept judicial appointments to act as a referee. Okay. And topic two, New York City Conflicts of Interest Board. I will briefly explain the functions of the Conflict of Interest Board, although I know we basically know about it. The Conflicts of Interest Board is the entity that serves to provide clear guidance to public employees regarding the Conflicts of Interest Code, which lays out the types of conduct prohibited by public servants. The Board is to achieve this through training, education, and the issuance and publication of advisory opinions relating to proposed future conduct. The Board also adopts rules to implement and interpret the provisions of the Conflict of Interest Code. It reviews and makes decisions on alleged violations of said code, 
with the power to impose fines that can be as high as $25,000 per violation, which when deemed appropriate can include suspension or dismissal from serving as a public servant of that city employee. The board also collects and reviews financial disclosure reports. The board consists of five members who are appointed by the mayor with the advice and consent of the city council. The mayor must also designate one of these members as chair of the board. The charter states that these members should be chosen for their independence, integrity, civic commitment, and high ethical standards. Board members serve a six-year term and may not serve more than two consecutive six-year terms pursuant to the New York City Charter. These board members are mandated to meet at least once per month and are prohibited from holding public office, seeking election to any public office, being a pu public employee in any jurisdiction, holding political party office, or appearing as a lobbyist before the city pursuant to Charter 2602B. Board members are entitled to receive compensation per diem for $250 for each calendar day that they perform work for the board. The chair receives $275. And I want to welcome the candidates, Mr. Crowell, Anthony Crowell, and Mr. Bohor Quez. Am I good? Very good. <laughs> Would you please raise your right hand to be sworn in? For the record, we have sworn in the three candidates. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, and Rules Committee members, you can find a written copy of the opening statements for these candidates in your book. Mr. Crowell, Ms. Bohorquist, do you wish to make any comments? Uh, yes, we, uh, I, will, I have an opening statement. I believe my colleague does as well. Um, I, I can start, okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It is a privilege to be here with you and the other members of the committee, and it's a, a wonderful thing to be back in the council chamber and back at City Hall. Uh, I'm Anthony Krell, and I am very pleased to have been nominated by Mayor de Blasio for reappointment to the Conflicts of Interest Board. I have greatly valued and would like to continue my service on the board because I am personally committed to contributing to the effectiveness and strength of New York City government. Indeed, this has been the focus of my career as a lawyer for more than 20 years, the bulk of which has been spent as a full-time New York City public servant. The corner, uh, cornerstone of effective and strong city government is public integrity and ensuring the public has confidence in the people who serve them. When done well, the positive impact of this work on equitable service delivery and on the willingness of others to invest in the city to create to create new opportunities for New Yorkers is tremendous. Accordingly, working to educate public servants about conflicts of interest and their obligations to avoid them or the appearance thereof is a paramount goal and a critical mission. Further, working effectively to develop, interpret, and enforce the conflicts of interest law, the annual disclosure law, and aspects of the lobbying law requires a board member to hold and appreciate a variety of informed perspectives about government service. I believe I hold and appreciate these perspectives for a number of reasons. During my service to the city, I have been subject to the conflicts of interest law and the financial disclosure law, now called the annual disclosure law. This includes my first role as an assistant corporation counsel for four years, then later as special counsel and counselor to Mayor Bloomberg for nearly 11 years, and now for the past five years as a member of the Conflict of Interest Board itself. My work as the mayor's counsel included serving as City Hall Ethics Counsel. It also required me to work closely with the board as well as the Department of Investigation. My service also required me to work in both agency-specific and citywide roles, collaborating closely with all branches of the government, especially the council, on a broad range of core governance issues, many of which included important issues of government ethics. This work, coupled with my more recent full-time experience as Dean and President of New York Law School, as a professor teaching state and local government law, and promoting professional responsibility and legal ethics daily, as well as my service on the board itself, 
gives me an informed understanding of the challenges faced by public servants. I believe my experience has served the board well so far, allowing me to bring a first-hand perspective on the practical and cultural contours of agency management and life on the front lines of policymaking and program implementation in city government. For these reasons, I would like to continue this important work on the conflicts of interest board and contribute to ensuring public confidence in and thus the overall vitality of New York City. Thank you. Would you like me to proceed? Thank you, Chair Koslowitz and members of the committee. Good morning. My name is Fernando Bojorquez, and I'm honored to appear here before you today, having been nominated by Mayor de Blasio for reappointment to the Conflicts of Interest Board. Although I was not born in New York, like millions of my fellow citizens, I have made the city my home. I came to Tribeca for law school, New York Law School, and honed my legal career in Midtown, and now raised my family in Brooklyn with my oldest of two boys attending PS321. I have a strong and steady streak of public service, serving on numerous nonprofit boards in the city and devoting hundreds of hours of pro bono work to, to our underserved immigrant communities. As a New Yorker, I have the greatest respect for the public officials who serve our city day in and day out. I believe that public servants want to do the right thing by the citizens they serve, and a fundamental role of the Conflicts of Interest Board and our ethics laws is to help them to do so. And that is why I wish to continue to serve on the board. I'm firmly committed to the board's mission of building public trust in those that serve and govern the city's citizens of New York, of promoting the public confidence in city government, and of protecting the integrity of government decision making. Over my last four years of service, I've had the privilege of contributing to the board's mission, and I believe that armed with that experience, I can provide even greater contributions during a second term. The board is charged with training and educating city employees on the ethical rules of Chapter 68, interpreting and providing confidential advice and guidance to public servants on those rules, prosecuting violations of Chapter 68, and administering and enforcing the annual disclosures laws. COIB's four pillars, training, advice, enforcement, and disclosure, are the gold standard of any independent government ethics board. It is these pillars that form the foundation that help build public trust in our city government. As a board member over the last four years, I've applied my legal and ethics training, my varied legal law firm practice and nonprofit board experience to provide practical counsel and advice to the board in all four of its charges. As a law firm partner who's steeped in public service and a first generation immigrant, I've brought a unique and diverse perspective to the board and its role in helping to build that public trust. And I believe that experience and perspective has served the board well so far. I've greatly valued my service on the board and would appreciate the opportunity and the privilege to continue to serve the city of New York by helping the board meet its mission to the best of my abilities. I believe it is important to have a robust and independent board that communicates to the public the importance of government ethics, the fidelity to our conflicts of interest laws, and the, and the will to innovate in this era of change. Thank you for your time and consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, <clears throat> I have two questions that I would like to ask. The Conflicts of Interest Board is charged with implementing and enforcing the city's ethics law contained in, charter, in Chapter 68 of the New York City Charter. COIB is also tasked with educating city employees concerning their ethical obligations and with acting in an advisory capacity to current and former city employees. My question concerns COIB's advisory role in the context of rendering advisory opinions in, opinions. in your replies to our pre-hearing questions, question number six, you both agree that COIB issues advisory opinions following a formal request for advice. Mr. Borquez, you explain that advisory opinions are typically issued after one or more city employees seeks an advice, seeks advice on a particular subject. Mr. Crow, you explain that you that advisory opinions are often issued to settle repeated questions in areas subject to confusion or differing interpretations of the law. You also assert 
that advisory opinions may offer interpretive guidance concerning new laws or rules. However, the Charter Section 2603 mandates that COIB render case-specific advisory opinions. Accordingly, COIB should restrict issuing advisory opinions to those instances in which it responds to a guidance request by a city employee. Such guidance would apply exclusively to the particular public servant making the request and not to city employees at large. Rules by COIB and not advisory opinions would seem to be the appropriate vehicle for issuing guidance to more than one city employee. The charter seemingly excuses, excludes using advisory opinions to offer any broad or inclusive guidance, whether in response to multiple inquiries or to offer interpretive guidance on issues that COIB deems confusing or subject to differing interpretations. Can you? How do you reconcile the Charter's provision concerning COIB's rulemaking power and its advisory opinion power and COIB's actual practice in its use of advisory opinions? Sure, I'd be happy to, to start, and I know my colleague will also have some perspectives on this. Um, I think it's important for us all to recognize how um, the board functions. First and foremost, uh, the board's mandate is set forth in the city charter in chapter 68, uh, and uh, the board is uh, authorized to issue rules um, that would follow the CAPA process outlined in chapter 45 of the charter, and those rules uh, give the fine points of implementation of the various provisions in the charter. Um, those rules are subject to uh, the provisions of the open meetings law and obviously public input by the um, uh, public input by members of the regulated community as well as the, the public at large. Um, what happens is once uh, the board is in the position of educating and implementing the law and rules, uh, advisory opinions, uh, are helpful for individual public servants who are seeking private advice. Uh, they're given uh, private advice to explain how uh, the provisions of the law and rules apply to the specific circumstances they present. Um, so that's a private advice letter. Advisory opinions are public letters that don't cite any one particular public servant's interests or concerns, certainly doesn't mention any public servant by name, but tries to explain in more general and more broad terms uh, how the law should be understand and how it should be operationalized in agencies or how public servants should behave or, or act in terms of uh, their compliance with the different provisions of the law and rules. And so advisory opinions serve a very important role to ensure that um, there aren't differing interpretations of the law or rules by individual uh, public servants or uh, individual agency counsel. And so um, it, it helps to settle and to bring clarity and focus to uh, the range of issues that the board is seeing uh, individual public servants ask. And just to amplify and dovetail on my colleague, I think taking a step back, you have chapter 68, which lays out the parameters of the law. And you have certain rules that expand on those rules and prohibitions and prescriptions. And when we have city servants and public servants who come to us with, for confidential advice, but we provide prospective confidential advice with respect to those specific circumstances and set of circumstances. When we issue an AO, it's because we've seen one or more city officials or public servants have come to us with questions that surround a particular issue. So we provide guidance that, as my colleague mentioned, helps the agencies and other public servants to understand how a particular rule or law would apply in certain circumstances. But there's really no substitute for the particular public servant to reach out to the board on a particular set of facts. So in terms of the board setting forth a prospective um, guidance, the advisory opinion serves the integral role of helping amplify what the law and the rules say. But there really is no, no substitute for the particular public servant to approach the board, say, hey, I have these particular set of facts how do I go about complying with the law under these facts after I've taken a look at the AO that may apply to this circumstance? Thank you, thank you. I want to uh, 
go to our uh, minority leader, Steve Matteo, for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just continuing the conversation on advisory opinions, um, I believe in your pre-stated uh, hearing answers, both of you state that the COI board is responsible yeah. for promulgating COIB's advisory opinions. It's required by the charter. While both of you claim board ownership of the advisory opinion process, the COIP staff, not the board, answer questions directly related to the advisory opinions. Questions that oftentimes are so directly tied to the advisory opinions they logically should have been included in the opinion and presumably would have, would have if COIP had opening hearings on advisory opinions before they are finalized and released. In one of your answers, um, I believe one of you stated that only three advisory opinions have been restated of 251 such opinions since 1989. The directly related questions are, in effect, staff modifications that point to a shortcoming in failing to hold public hearings. So with that, I'm asking if you can elaborate on question five concerning holding public hearings before rendering advisory opinions. And just for the record, uh, in the pre-hearing um, questions, question five is what role does COIP play in issuing advisory opinions? How heavily does the board and you personally rely on COIP staff? in the preparation and issuance of advisory opinions, and how much independent and critical review does the board give drafts of advisory opinions before they are formally released? So if you both can comment. Can I just ask one follow-up question? Um, can, question six is the question concerning the public comment period, and then you were referencing question five. Yeah, the, the advisory opinions. Um, what role does COI play in issuing the advisory opinions? So would you like me to expand on the role that the board plays in issuing advisory opinions? Mm hmm Okay. Um, as I lay forth in the three and, and I'm sorry, in holding public hearings. Okay. Uh, I'll do, I'll Before do the, the opinion, though. Pardon? Holding, it, it basically the holding public opinion, uh, public hearings before rendering the advisory opinion. Sure. That's the crux of what I'm asking you to expand on. I think it's good to take a step back and walk through the process of how an AO comes to be. Um, again, as we've said, it begins with initially, typically it begins with a confidential in inquiry for one or more public servants. We as the board meet on a monthly basis. At those monthly meetings, we are presented by the staff with very detailed memoranda that highlight the applicable laws and the rules and the precedent that apply to that particular issue. We then engage in a dialogue back and forth with the staff as to whether, as to the content of the opinion that's gonna be rendered to that public servant. And then during the course of that dialogue, the board comes to a decision whether or not there should be an advisory opinion should be issued concerning that, that advice. It, whether it's helpful for that opinion want to be rendered at a, on a large, more public scale with obviously the confidential information redacted from the AO when it's eventually issued. Now the reason why I stated in my pre-hearing issues why I do not believe that hearing, hearing should be held before the issuance of the AO is, is threefold. One, remember the AOs are rooted in the confidential nature of the exercise of rendering advice. Um, there may be an issue with compromising the conf confidential nature of that, of that service. Also, we pride ourselves in providing that advice on a timely basis. So having, an open, having open meetings in connection with a AO could also delay the advice. Uh, second, the idea of interpreting the law falls squarely within the board's province. It's almost a quasi-adjudicatory process where we are charged with interpreting and, and interpreting chapter 68 to a particular set of circumstances. Um, and finally, I think it's worked pretty well. Uh, as I've stated in my, in my responses, in, as far as I know, of the 250 plus AOs that we've issued in the, since 1989, there have only been three revised opinions in the history of the board. Yeah, I would add to that that um, because the advisory opinions are uh, interpretation of the law and rules. The law and rules themselves have been through a public process. The rules in particular by following CAPA uh, and um, the input as to the fine points of those rules. Uh, council members, other public servants, and members of the public generally can, um, can help shape what those rules ultimately look like through their participation in, in that process. The advisory opinions are um, 
are a further explanation of how those rules are to be applied to different types of activities undertaken by public servants. One of the things, though, uh, to remember is the advisory opinions themselves aren't rules. They're an expression of how the rules are to be interpreted and uh, operationalized. But the staff, um, and certainly uh, this is, I believe, the, the view of the entire board, the staff does take it on themselves um, with our encouragement and support to do broad outreach to affected agencies and entities who give guidance to public servants to make sure that the perspectives that need to be heard before issuing the, a general uh, advisory opinion uh, are accounted for. And so I think that's an important process um, that shouldn't be overlooked. And it also is one that targets um, uh, especially agency counsel who would have particularized experience with the nature of the activities that public servants within their agencies may be undertaking and how to ensure that um, the types of questions that you're concerned about are actually addressed through, through uh, the issuance of an, ad, uh, an ad advisory opinion to the extent that we haven't heard um, the full range of concerns on a specific subject matter, but only have, you know, we're addressing some requests for advice, but not necessarily all the kinds of questions that might be helpful to have a, a, an answer from the board. Okay, um, and thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Mr. Bojarquez, just to go back to your uh, confidential, uh, your, your, your point on, on confidentiality, um, if that is not an issue and it's redacted and, and, and confidentiality is not an issue, your, your main concern is the delay um, of a public hearing in I releasing the opinion? I think adding a public hearing process could, uh, it, interlaying a public hearing into that process could delay the rendering of advice to that particular public servant. And do you believe that even you're talking about a, that you believe that there, there could be a delay? Obviously, there will be, but do, do you believe that a public hearing could be helpful to the advisory opinion before it's released? Well, I think to echo what my, my colleague mentioned was we do reach out to particular agency counsel and individuals that we think can provide helpful input before we issue an AO. So I think to the extent that we need a forum to incorporate other circumstances that would be helpful in issuing the AO, I think we address that by informally reaching out to individuals and agencies and, and other affected individuals to help us render a practical AO on a particular just, subject. Just so I'm clear, how you said informally reaching out, how, how are you reaching out to uh, eight, um, how, how are you contacting them for their opinion? The, the general counsel. Yeah, the general counsel reaches okay. out to particular agency heads and counsel, his right. counterpart at other agencies. Yep, okay, thank you. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, council Member Torres. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I have, have the same line of questioning, so I suspect we're gonna be repeating ourselves, but okay. Mr. Carmel, in your response to question six, you, you point out that the public comment process pursuant to the City Administrative Procedure Act, CAPA, only applies to rules rather than advisory opinions. And you then go on to point out that advisory opinions are not rules per se, but rather interpretation of rules. And I, I recognize that there's a legal difference between advisory opinions and rules, but, but do you recognize that the line between rulemaking and rule interpretation may not be as clear-cut in practice as it might be legally on paper? Um, I think that the, the difference between rulemaking and advisory opinions, um, it, it is, it, I think that's why there is a board um, of independent individuals who are using their professional judgment and understanding the various ways in which um, public servants encounter the application of the rules and then trying to ensure that there's a consistent application of the rules that uh, ensures that conflicts are avoided or the appearance of conflicts is, is understood when someone's coming close to the line, but also to make sure that um, there's a well-functioning government and that government employees, public servants, aren't um, uh, unduly restricted. So I think that um, the rules set forth a very clear set of parameters by which to operate. However, the advisory opinions give further elucidation about different permutations, different nuances uh, that individual public servants or groups of public servants may be encountering. Anyone 
can come to the board for private advice. Oftentimes you will find that that private advice is sought um, for further explication of an advisory opinion um, or further confirmation that the proposed activity by the public servant is, is consistent with what the rules and therefore the advisory opinion in very plain language is offering as, as a set of guidance, a set of uh, operational points on how to behave um, in very plain language. So um, I think there, there's a difference, but there's not an inconsistency. And so I think the advisory opinions are, um, are an important tool to have further explanation of what a rule is trying to do and also uh, to give a level of clarity and accessibility to, to rules that sometimes can be written with a little bit of precise language and legalese, and, and that's not there either. So we wanna make sure that um, the material is, uh, the, the rules are accessible to public servants. Please. The, the only thing I would add is, I understand your question, it's a good question, but I think the law itself sort of bakes into the, that distinction. If you look at chapter 68, 2603C does not provide for open meetings or proceedings in connection with, with advisory opinions, but with respect to rulemakings, all rulemakings do fall within the city administration. So set, set aside CAPA, because I'm not, I'm not asking what COIB is legally required to do. I'm asking what COIB should do in the interest of public accountability and transparency. Is that given the occasionally blurred line between rulemaking and rule interpretation, you know, reasonable people could disagree about at what point does rulemaking does rule interpretation effectively become rulemaking? It seems like a question on which peop reasonable people of goodwill can disagree, and that's the rationale for a public process. And the term advisory opinion is, is, is almost, it's deceptively benign, right? Because you're, when you're issuing an advisory opinion, you're interpreting your own rules, and your enforcement can often result in stiff fines and penalties. So it has, in the real world, it has a binding effect. It has a coercive effect. It has the effect of a rule. If it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it, it's probably a duck. And so, so just I'm expressing a personal opinion here. I do believe that advisory opinion should be subject to some kind of public comment process in the interest of public transparency. On your point about confidentiality, uh, you cited confidentiality as an argument against the public comment period. Uh, why would a public comment period necessarily result in the loss of confidentiality, you know, one could easily imagine a public comment period that focuses on the proposed advisory opinion without disclosing the confidential details of the case that inspired that opinion. Well, I, I believe in my response, as I said, there's a potential. It could, it, there's a potential that it could compromise confidentiality because remember the AO is, is rooted in the exercise of providing confidential advice to a particular pr public servant. So if we were to open it up to an open meeting and an open process, we would have to make sure, we would have to take great pain because I cannot overstate the importance of the confidentiality, the nature of the confidentiality of this process. The board would have to take great pains to ensure that in that process of a public hearing that we would have to ensure that no confidentiality would be, confidentiality would be cr compromised in any way in some sort of an open hearing process. That, that's what I was getting at. I mean, look, I think here in the council, we take great pains every day. Many of the laws that the city council passes are inspired by confidential constituent cases. And we manage to hold hearings on those laws without ever disclosing the confidential details of our constituent cases. So if the city council can manage to have a public process without compromising confidentiality, my question is why can't the conflict of interest board do the same? And, and so that would be my disagreement with you. I don't know if you want any further comment or. Well, it's not provided in the, in the charter, and that is something that if we were to consider, we would have to we would have to really think that through how we would actually need to implement it. Maybe look at how you handle it here, the city council, see how you do how you handle the confidentiality issue. So there's openness to a public comment period as long as confidentiality was assured, or is that all? All I'm saying is that it's it's a potential issue that we would have to deal with if we were to consider such an issue, okay. such a move. Um, I do have more questions. I don't know. Um, okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bohorkeres, um, do you, my understanding is that you engage in fundraising. Is that 
I have engaged in, in uh, I served as a co-host in three events in the four years that I've been on the board, yes, in connection with federal elections. So I have no reason to doubt your qualifications as an individual. I have no reason to doubt that you're a person of the utmost professional and personal integrity. That's why the mayor nominated you. But broadly speaking, I do have concerns about the notion of appointing a fundraiser to the conflict of the <coughs> of interest board. It, it seems to me the conflict of interest board I I is an apolitical institution, right? It should have both the substance and the appearance of neutrality. And I worry that political fundraising, which is the most political of all political activities, could inevitably raise questions about the board's appearance of political neutrality. So can you address that concern that I have? Absolutely, and thank you for the question. I'll say that before I joined the board, I received an opinion from then General Counsel Wayne Hawley that set forth, I believe I shared it with uh, Mr. Davis that may have been shared with the, with the council itself, with the committee itself, um, laying out all the rules and applicable prohibitions under Chapter 68. And under Chapter 68, the law specifically provides that as a board member, uh, I cannot engage in any fundraising or political contributions with respect to any city elected official or any race that a city elected official is, enga is engaged in. Um, when I was appointed four years ago, this was a topic of conversation. I believe Council, Council Member Chin was there as well. And we, we discussed this through and to address some of these issues, I t undertook a specific commitment <coughs> to then Chair Lander that may also be included in your, in your uh, packet where I took another personal commitment that said in addition to the laws and the regulations under chapter 68, that I would also agree to commit myself not to participate in any race where a city, city council member may have announced uh, their candidacy in any race, state or federal. And I have, I have complied with that advisory opinion from the board and with that personal commitment that I made to the council four years ago. Um, as it stands now, there is no prohibition with respect to state and federal uh, participation. Um, I have take, taken great pains to make sure that there's no appearance of any impropriety in those issues. There are congressional federal races. One was for president, uh, candidate for president Hillary Clinton. The other was for a race in New Mexico. Another was for a uh, race in upstate New York. And I, I wouldn't necessarily qualify as, as a fundraiser. It's more of just joining a host committee with several but, other members. But you're members. playing a role in raising money for right, candidates. Right. So. And, and as, I, as I mentioned then, I mentioned, and I'll say today, you know, I have been very vigilant to comply with all of my rules and obligations yeah. under Chapter 68, as well as the, uh, the opinions and the advice that's been given to me. But even under the law and even under your self-imposed restrictions, you have the ability to raise funds for state elected officials. And the state has immense influence over the governance of New York City. You have the ability to raise funds for federal elected officials. And the federal elected officials have immense influence. In fact, it's often the case that state and, and federal elected officials can often have more influence over the governance of New York City than council members, who are sometimes reduced to passing resolutions. So even if you're not directly, even if you're not fundraising for state and federal elected officials who are directly or indirectly influencing the governance of New York City, the fact that that's even a theoretical possibility is, is cause for concern. And I just want to be forthright with you. I, I'm wondering if, if you were, suppose you were required to give up fundraising altogether, would, would, would you continue to have an interest in serving on the conflict of interest board? Would that be a deal breaker for you? Or? Well, let, let, let me answer it this way. Yeah. My interest and commitment to the board is completely separate and apart from any of my political activities. I, as I stated earlier, I have a deep commitment to the mission of this board. Um, if, the, if the board were to a, a, adopt a rule or some sort of s amendment to the city charter that would apply to state and federal political activities, no, that would, not be a board, that would not be a deal breaker to my service on the board because I believe in the mission and I'm committed to the mission of this board. Thank you. I thank you for your answers. Thank you, thank you. Council Member Chin. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
My question is that um, you've served for four years, both of you. Thank you for your service. So within this past four year, um, what do you think about the effectiveness uh, of the uh, conflict of interest training um, on public servants? Because I know as council member, we're mandated to do the training every year, and I find that very helpful. Um, and the resources are open to us. Um, so in terms of the effectiveness of the training, and also whether, um, I think it was in the question too, whether um, the board, the agency has enough sufficient uh, staff and expertise um, to carry out that mission um, to make sure that uh, all city employees, you know, are trained and then they have their questions answered. Um, I think the training, the training unit of the board is, is, is exemplary. As you know, they're charged with training all 300,000 city public servants, and they do a fantastic job. Uh, I believe in the last annual report in 2016, uh, the, the training staff trained thousands of city employees, whole city agencies, and has been really engaged in some innovative uh, training and education projects such as the COI training wiki, uh, the Daily Dose on Twitter, these uh, training videos. So I think that they, the COI training staff is doing an excellent job with the resources that it has. Um, the one issue that I think there may require some additional budget, but I think that question is more appropriate for the executive director, is the training on the new Local Law 181 of 2016 with respect to disclosures and donations um, to uh, nonprofit entities that are controlled or affiliated with the elected official. That's a new thing that the board is now dealing with this year. Um, that's on top of all the training that we've been doing for years. I would agree that the uh, board training staff is exemplary over my years in government service. I've seen the uh, education and uh, what we call what we now call the education and engagement unit go from one or two uh, individual trainers to six um, working really diligently to scale the operation uh, and to make sure that there's a high level of visibility uh, and recognition that the board is out there that the board is interested in training and uh, alerting uh, public servants to their sure. obligations um, to m understand and comply with the conflicts of interest law and also to avoid appearances of any conflicts of interest. So I think that um, it's been highly successful and they, they are committed to reaching people the way people reach each other in, in the modern world, a uh, high degree of uh, use of technology and social media. Uh, I think it's, it's very innovative, very different for a government agency, and I applaud it for, for its efforts in that vein uh, and to engage people continuously. So it's a, it's a very nice thing and something that I think we need to be very proud of in New York City government as, as compared to the way other state and local governments may promote their ethics programs. I think just the fact that, I mean, we, we get those tweets uh, in terms of violation, and if you just look at the number of violations in terms of the number of employees, I think that's pretty good track record um, that people are following the, the law and, mm -hmm. and abiding by the rules. But I think that that is something that uh, maybe an, another component could be really educating the public in terms of the, the strict rules and regulation that city employees and elected officials uh, have to abide by so that they also, it's a way of building trust and confidence in government. Helpful suggestion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no one has filled out a form to speak from the public, I'm now going to call on a vote. William Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote, committee on rules, privileges, and elections, and 14, 15, and 16. Chair Kozlowitz. I vote aye. Chin. I vote aye. Espinal. I vote aye. Traeger. Uh, well, congratulations to the nominees, I vote aye. Adams. I vote aye. Matteo. We have a vote of six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. All items have been adopted by the committee. OK. 
Okay, I am gonna hold this meeting open. Uh, as you saw, some of my colleagues left. They had a meeting downstairs, and I'm going to hold this hearing open. Okay. Good.